Hey, Tony, how are you? Very good, Yale. And I can see that the sun is up this time as opposed to us. We're doing this by morning, not by night. Uh, but it, it's, it's early evening. I mean, around five. So, yep. yeah, our five is your tree. <laughs> um, but we wake up very early, so that's fine. Um, yeah, we, we suggested uh, to speak about COP26 as it just ended up with an agreement. Um, I feel that you have a lot to say about that agreement and the continuity of it. Um, but before that, I would like to make a small retrospective of what happened before in the previous editions and what we learned from them. Um, Tell us a bit, you know, a few points. I just want to mention that you uh, published last week uh, an awesome post about the COP26 measurement, performance measurement. And that was um, very um, engaging and um, <laughs> pointing out a few uh, paradoxes. So the stage is yours. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if the stage is mine. I think it comes out of the conversations we've had. It's just applying it to the framework. Um, and it, it's this, I, I think it's, there's, there's, and I, I hope this is true as I repeat it, but apparently one of the, the um, parts in Buddhism, uh, not that I'm Buddhist at all, so if I represent it wrong, deepest apologies and please come and correct me. But one of the things about Buddhism is you can hold two things and you hold them with equal weight and you can hold them, they're diametrically opposed. So one says, um, eat this apple and one says, don't eat this apple, but you can hold two facts and you can look at them and hold them with complete equal weight yeah. without making a judgment. And the purpose of being able to do that is that you don't go off down a particular path, that if you go down a path, you're, you're going down a path holding two things together trying to equally weigh them and give them equal importance so if you think something like this you will think something like that and you, you hold them together so they're the same facts but can, uh, same as, as any dilemma you can take the same facts and end up with two completely different conclusions the same with the paradoxes and the whole idea of so many of the things I'm trying to do and write about is that it's very easy to separate people by saying uh, I'm right I'm wrong where actually we're both right and we're both wrong and we've got to equally value absolutely everything and the problem we don't like about equally valuing everything is it creates the paradox yes. that's why we don't like it because then we have to face the decision and actually it's easier not to reface the decision by just valuing one outcome um and so much of the time we do this this two items it's one or the other but everything actually society is about is four things which is the human survival human thriving it's all about us and it's all about me and it's when you take those four things together actually that's where you don't just face a dilemma of it's you're now in a sort of this quasi matrix of which one of the two things do i want to hold you're not you have to hold four things and you can become completely paralyzed and this is what i think we see at cop 26 is that they're trying to compromise for everybody, but in the compromise for everybody, we don't sort anything out. And that to me is the frustration. Um, and then we've hit the, you know, the ideology of one and a half degrees. And I, yeah, yeah. Have, completely agree. <laughs> it's uh, an ideology, <laughs> a concept. Yeah. And, and I suppose the, the, the ultimate complexity and I think we don't see this in the news, the complexity of what's actually happening is deeply complex. And almost the same with it, the whole world's been through a pandemic, yet we don't understand the virologist who stood on stage going, this is, this is what's happening and this is where it's going. Yet we boil it down to, you should have a vaccine or not have a vaccine. So we take the complexity and we create a simple linear narrative and we forget the complexity and we just argue over the, the interpretation of the simple linear narrative. And exactly the same with one and a half degrees. We've forgotten the complexity about 
why it was reached. And we argue about the rights and wrongs about one and a half degrees. So we argue about the simple linear narrative and we don't understand why. It's the same, it's a cause and effect sort of problem. I have a graph uh, that I designed at the very beginning of the, the road to sustainability reviews that demonstrates that the more time we take to decide and to break yeah. things, the more complex becomes the sustainable state. And yeah. that somehow reminds me that we can remain doubtful about the decision that I made, that I made during COPs, whatever, yeah. six and the next one, 27. Um, and until, until we achieve that point of getting an average temperature around the globe, we're gonna have to take a lot of decisions and that accumulation of decisions are gonna be biased by default because historically uh, the systems are broken. Yeah. How, what would be, I mean, how can we conceive or at least suggest um, lines that could help us reduce the consumption of energy, electricity, and become much more sustainable and whatever is sustainable. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a clever piece of um, marketing we've all come to accept. Yeah. Um, and the, the clever piece of marketing we've all come to accept is the, is the brakes on your car mean the car can go faster. The technology in your car means you can go faster from the window wipers to the headlights, to the indicators, to the brakes, to the, um, the airbags, everything means you can go faster. So we depend on technology to allow us to go faster. I know the analogy breaks, but just as a rough one, you know, let's go faster and faster towards almost the demise in the hope the technology will come along and be able to stop us. So we'll be able to use carbon capture. We'll be able to use what well, technology will solve. And this is, you know, the dilemma. We kind of like depended on technology. Um, you know, the, uh, I think, it, I think it's best part of 50 years ago, Intel in November, 50 odd years ago, uh, launched the 4044, which was the Intel processor. And you really could have subscribed most of the wealth in the world since that point has come down to us being able to use processors and that piece of silicon, mm. which has allowed us to go faster and faster and faster. Um, but we haven't always learned what the brakes are until afterwards. And I'd come out of COP26 with yeah. this dilemma, you know, you're going to Hanukkah, we're going towards Christmas, the world's festivals occur at varying points around the world. And you have this just dilemma of the advertising on TV is telling you consume more, you know, go faster, do more, party more, eat more, drink more. It's all OK. Buy more presents. Yet COP26 is saying, guys, we just got to stop. Yet there seems to be this <laughs> paradox, <laughs> a dilemma uh, being faced. And COP26 is here for a week. And unfortunately, this is in your face every single day. So I'm not sure how, where the brakes are as we're getting faster and faster and faster. It is confusing. And you speak about optimization and performance in your piece from last week. Um, I'm not sure that at a, a level, at the state level, and so far we know um, decisions can be made unilaterally, um, unilaterally for everyone. I'm not yeah. even sure that, you know, you mentioned in one of our, uh, during our um, offline conversation that um, some brands like Tesco, I see Amazon, I see um, whoever is uh, on Regent Street um, holding a, a, a big place. Um, is driving realistically towards sustainability goals. I mean, it's not even realistic when it comes to, as a brand, 
to start selling products and to make productivity and, and, to, and to grow um, when it comes to holidays, right after <laughs> a summit that is supposed to tell people, okay, people <laughs> just reduce your consumption, just take care, just start by thinking ahead. It's, uh, it's it, I think the confusion here is much more, it, it's much deeper than what we think. Um, yeah. Um, I, yeah, and in that conversation, you know, there's, there's, there's a number of quotes uh, throughout all of history, which, which really, you know, come down to a number of different ways of saying it, but you want the truth, but I'm not sure if you can handle the truth. Um, you know, a few good men, you can handle the truth, but it's, I, I, and that is, you know, one of them almost is COP26 saying the, the, the reality and the truth is, and you see the emotion of the people saying, look, guys, if we don't stop, you, you, you have taken a collective choice to wipe us out. You have taken a collective choice to do this. Yet the advertising a week later is come consume more. There isn't the still the crying face of the emotion person whose whole community uh, and almost indigenous population is going to be wiped out because of the choice you're making by the purchasing that you're now doing. And yeah, we as humans have this really odd relationship, I think, about how to equally value two things, hold them together and say, how do we make a choice? It's a, yeah, and, and I don't, yeah. And it, it's this aspect, I suppose, therefore, of leadership. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's and leadership. Yeah. A question: How a leader today can counterbalance his decision? Her decision. Yeah, I mean, if ever <laughs> there is a decision to take, uh, I mean, how can we distinguish to, as of today the reality of our world? and what could catalyze in a very systemic way, resilience, uh, sustainability, uh, purpose. How can we conceive that in a world that is like continuing, continuously, de is continuously dependent on, on consumption uh, and capitalism and whatever. We, we speak about that many, many times. Um, yeah. And it, <laughs> In so many ways, the you know, just as one tiny little um, data point, the uh, I say the youth, um, those below thirty are all made already making lots of lifestyle choices and decisions. Uh, one in what they eat, how they eat, where they live, how they live. Uh, also, they're investing um, that they have, you know, they are participating in the capital society, uh, but they're making choices with where they decide to invest their monies and how they invest their monies and in which funds they're going to put that money. Uh, yes, I think we've still got a question about the data that sits behind it, but they are proactively trying to make those choices. And I suppose it's that gap in leadership that they feel that the leaders aren't, the leaders still want to be voted in and they still see that appeasing the population is the easiest way to remain voted in i.e. sit on the fence, don't really fall on one side, don't act until it's too late, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which we see in the vast majority of politicians because they know they will get voted back in on that because that allows them to fulfil being in, in power. Yet the youth are turning around and going, well, you're not leading us, so we're going to have to make those choices anyway. Yeah. Um, and when enough of those youth actually have enough of a voice and in power, will we see new leadership? Yeah, yeah, and that that's a turning point, and it's really important because I, I was thinking um, about social media against um, the world. Um, we see metaverse, we see a, a lot of new movements that are much more assimilated to me personally as time and momentum than anything that is like new. But what is seems to be something that is a paradigm is that whatever we attribute as PR, marketing, personal aspects 
to value someone is going to turn it to something that is like, what do you have in your wallet? Where do you invest your money that is going to define you as an individual in a society that is continuously evolving? Now, related to COP26, I think that the disruption in between the senior uh, generation that decides today whatever is going to be attributed for tomorrow, what is going to be good for tomorrow, is probably not going to happen because of this young generation that comes with a new power and a new leadership that much more relate to where they put their math and money and how they conceive the world without any leadership. Mm. As um, and I'm not sure that social media is going to solve that issue or create any link between th those two points, the bridge between these gaps um, with next generations. I think that they know that they will need to invest more, um, more money, more into their health, um, and more about leadership and how they, they conceive the world if they want to survive. And I can hear them during hackathons, during webinars, the feedback. Um, they do have worries. And those are not the same as, that, as we did. Yeah. Before. I, I, and I suppose I, I look to that generation to reestablish a relationship, kind of like the, in, in a way the current generation has lost. An old generation, and this is many generations ago, had a kind of like direct relationship between the physical labor they put in. Yeah, absolutely. The token they got from the physical labor they put in to allow them to be fed. And there was a direct relationship. Now, I don't want to go back to that. That's not what I'm harking on about. But when currently we've created technologies which disassociate that value. Yeah. And I suppose the next piece of it is how do we recreate in the new digital world where everything, you know, there is there, you know, the money is just a token, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's a perception of value. For, so there's a relationship between what you do and what you have, because that's, we, we've disconnected those two things completely. And it's not that that's wrong to disconnect them. And I don't know if it's right to connect them again, but it's the association of, or perception of value hence the reason when you go to the supermarkets and you're just consuming you don't see the value in the consumption yeah yeah because there's no there's no direct relationship yeah. and some in a way somebody's got to sort part of that problem out if we want to put the brakes on mm -hmm. because we can't just depend on technology to solve us and get us out of the sustainability gap for sure not, we, we cannot count on that. And that's why we, I don't believe that uh, today uh, technologies like AI-based or blockchain can solve our existential issues. Um, it's, it's- Well, blo blockchain certainly won't, not with the, the, uh, <laughs> the energy consumption it has, but- <laughs> Yeah, much more related to consumption and, and supply chains and- um, well, yeah, I, I go back to value. Actually, there's an interesting one because I think uh, Soshi's Soshi's um, current Bitcoin is is worth you know, somewhere between seventy and eighty billion dollars right now, and people put it out, and it's like, yeah, but it's not because you need the access code to be able to access that. Then you need to be able to trade. So just to say, because somebody has this number of bitcoins and the current market value is this, they have that value is untrue because if you cannot access those Bitcoins or don't have an ability to trade them, yeah. then that value doesn't exist. And that kind of like is the gap that I'm trying to articulate is that you, you have this perception of value, but actually the value doesn't really exist unless you can trade. It is a very, very complex um, aspect of our lives that I think that we uh, arrived at that point after that we created systems that are supposed to help us with accelerating and automating our actions and create these types of databases that are supposed to provide us with the service and 
somehow the trading models, the new trading models. But as I understand and how, as how you conceive, these are not the values that we need for our societies. Although it can help us access freedom and decide where we want to invest and how we want to lead our lives. But it's not the way to solve the issues that we have currently on the environmental or whatever natural processes. And, and this is very complex. Yeah. In, in terms of perception. Um, yeah. And, and, and that perception to me, it, it's, it's this dilemma of um, uh, the paradox of leadership. Because I want leaders to go hard and fast, okay, which therefore they look for the signal, they look for the innovation, they look for the original thought, they ask the right questions, and they just kind of like encourage us to go in a particular direction. But we've translated leadership into late and slow, um, i.e. be data-led, be customer-led, be risk-adverse, uh, manage within your risk matrix. Um, let's not make errors. Let's not uh, undermine something and uh, it's all about um preserving what you've got and and i suppose that's the gap i'm seeing even at cop 26 yeah. the, the the leaderships and the sovereign state leaderships particularly uh, are all late and slow they, because there's no incentive to go hard and fast and even if a country um and my new word that i learned this week uh, which is ultra virus U-L-T-R-A-V-I-R-E-S. I've never even come across this word um, beyond the powers. Even if a country commits to go hard and fast, it's, it, will not, it cannot be held accountable. It cannot be held to account for it. And the same if you go late and slow and miss it. Uh, and this is much of what was said at COP26. Out of COP22, they said we'd, we'd halve the deforestation and we didn't do it, but we can't hold anybody to account. And there's a gap at the sovereign state level. And I think this is the gap we feel but we can't see and touch that all these parties come together but nobody's held account we don't have a a global piece which says actually countries you're giving up your sovereign state right in right. this decision every sovereign state still has its sovereignty so it doesn't have to ask for forgiveness and approval by another state and it can't be held accountable by another state we can only trade we can only hold individuals we can't hold state to state and therefore, we have this sort of gap. Um, it's it, and it's a beyond the powers problem. That this is beyond the powers of any one state to hold another state to account if it doesn't actually do the actions it says to deliver one and a half degrees. So they can agree. It is absolutely that. It is it, there is a, a, such a paradox, and I saw a graph the other day that shows that on the upper level of the graph, with all the biggest countries spending a huge amount of money to fix their own issues, deciding for the rest of the world, which represent, you know, maybe 10 to 20% of the decision makers today that impact the whole globe. Now, there is an inter interesting paradox here to say that, as you mentioned, the ultra virus today are not beyond or I mean, above the state. Hmm. So who takes accountability about what's next? Who can do that? And yeah. why? And, and, and it's a gap. You know, it, it's interesting because uh, I suppose as global citizens, we never felt that gap because it was all about trade. And trade could be sorted because actually one state can hold another company to account, but it's the state to state gap. Mm -hmm. which we're starting to see and i think it's it's one of these things that um as oh i suppose it's a level of complexity where people have understood this for many 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 years but it's becoming more aware to the general population because of the urgency that we need to sort out something and usually when there's urgency people go well let's call for regulation let's call for law let's call for this let's call for this and at this one and a half degrees ideology there's actually nothing. <laughs> and there's just this gap and you're just sitting there going, okay. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting view because 
again, um, the issues are here are way, way larger than what we can conceive ever. As yeah. things. Um, and, I, and I believe that uh, we're not gonna be able to solve them in the next decade, probably not, maybe not even in the century, but at least provide with a good mindset and, and at least create the new tools that we need to measure and to, and to solve some of the issues could be helpful. And that's not going to be technology as we know of it today. Probably not. Yeah, and, uh, and I suppose one of the other activities we're seeing as, as humans is that what people are noticing is anomalies, something that is a bit strange, something that's a bit odd. And you kind of like know that, uh, you know, a simple one, which everybody sort of ascribes to is the weather feels like it's changing. You know, this year, uh, we're, we're rapidly getting towards December and the trees are still got all their leaves, which is just very, very, very strange. So it is an anomaly. And, um, you know, there's lots of websites where you can now start to report anomalies. And, and this is, it becomes interesting because we're starting to collect data, which kind of like people have, it would have taken an incredibly long time to report all of these and actually see them. And actually they become a body of evidence of, yeah, we kind of did know what it was like and this is different, but we don't always know the exact difference. And as more and more anomalies come on and more and more change comes on, I think we're going to see more and more people come to the party going, there actually is a problem and we need to hold somebody accountable. And I think that's the piece. It's almost to me the next piece of unlocking the jigsaw is kind of like the world's got to say, who do we hold accountable? And it's not going to be the UN. It's not going to be, I don't know, there isn't a body we can currently turn to. And, the, and I don't know how the, the world's leading powers are going to come to that sort of agreement because they don't want it because it would make their power suddenly become substituted to somebody else, which they don't want because then, you know, they're not in control of their own destiny, which is kind of like what sovereign state is all about. I'm sure there's lots of great work out there on it, but how it's going to trend, you know, how it's going to come about, I think is just, yeah, super interesting. Right. Um, because I think that even during the previous uh, editions, and that's, to come back, you know, at, 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 uh, during uh, the introduction, we said that if we have a retrospective back in time about how COP 26, 25, and, and before um, came up with new agreements, I think that none of the agreements realistically, even the 2015 from the Paris Agreement um, impacted us uh, at, at the decision level. Um, and even if we're six or seven years from there, uh, it didn't really have concrete um, results as of today. So it's like, I think that um, it's good as a summit as a, as, and as a reminder to the world and to, and to take dates and to mention the roadmap of what we have to do. I'm not sure it's, as you mentioned, it's directly linked to, in terms of time, you know, <laughs> directly links at, right before holidays. And mm. it's probably not something that we can solve today. Yeah. People forget and, really easily. And there's a, there's a good site out there on temperature anomalies. And I think part of it, you know, people sit there going one and a half degrees. And why have we got 10 years? And if you go back in the graph, basically we've gone up by about half a degree in the last 10 years and you know the issue is that you know we're going to go from the you know uh, somewhere around one degree probably you know in 10 years towards two you know this isn't a case of oh this is extremely slow because the world's very 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 big actually we've done incredible amount of anomaly change uh, really since 1980 and it is just got in the last particularly 10 years or so far, far, far bigger and worse as, a, as, a, as an effect. Um, and I think it's that piece we can't see the overall effect. And it's like, it, 
I suppose it's it's even with um, brakes on the car, everybody getting faster. Um, what we don't notice is all cars getting faster over the period we've had cars because of the introduction of technologies. And it's that general realize, oh, we've always driven at that speed. We've always driven that fast. We've always done that because you can't notice the subtle changes each year the cars introduce from, you know, noise buffling. You know, if we, if one of the easiest ways to get people slowed down is just remove all of the noise buffling inside the car. The car will make so much noise. Reality is you will slow down. <laughs> So technology enables a lot of, unlocks actually, a lot of speed, capacity, performance, but it doesn't solve the issue that we have to face and to address. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's like speed buffling, in, or, or the buffling inside the car, so noise buffling, it hides the problem. Indeed. Indeed. And you know, in a way, brakes hide the problem. <laughs> Very encouraging for the next generation. <laughs> yeah. And that in so many ways, you know, we depend on technology to hide the problem. Yeah. That, you know, if we manage to do carbon capture, we actually haven't solved the problem. What we've done is hidden the problem. That reminds me a conversation we had about transparency. Yeah. So that's uh, back, on another topic. <laughs> yeah. And, and I suppose it's back to the thing, you know, I can tell you the truth, but I'm not sure you either want to know the truth or will accept the truth. Absolutely. And how do you hold many concepts with equal value at the same time and equally value them therefore you can actually see the dilemmas that we as society face as opposed to just holding one viewpoint and believing it's completely right which is what's happening right now yeah obviously um, and when you hold one viewpoint what you can't do is come to that piece of how do we hold people to account good question Excellent question. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I just, you know, I think it's part of the the whole discussion is um, none of this is simple or quick. Of course not. Of course not. But we actually haven't got the time. <laughs> you know. So yeah. it's finding the great people. Time is a concept. So maybe yeah. we can make space. Oh, don't. Don't take me there. <laughs>